Megan Abbott is the author of four period noir novels that range from the early 30s to the late 50s. The novels have garnered her three nominations from the Mystery Writers of America for their prestigious Edgar Award, including a win for Queen Pin. She earned her doctorate from NYU, publishing her dissertation, The Street Was Mine, White Masculinity in Hard-Boiled Fiction and Film Noir. According to Laura Lippmann, she is simply one of the most exciting and original voices of her generation. And James Elroy says, she is poised to ascend to the top rung of crime writing and possibly something beyond. Please help me in welcoming Megan Abbott. In terms of bringing you in for a film noir series, there's always the temptation to, to ask about your impressions of film noir. But I think actually going back to your work, we get an idea of how you think of noir both in, in fiction and film. From uh, Queen Pin, I, I quote uh, from here, and somehow, somehow, she saw something in me, something in the face, like a bar of soap, plain, unshaped, ready for dirt, made for it. <laughs> and I, I think that's a really interesting way of talking about protagonists of film noir in that there are certain type of people that as clean as they may be, no matter how, how they were created, they're just ready to get into those situations. Right, yeah, I think that's sort of what it speaks to in all of us when we, why we're sort of drawn to it as readers or as, as moviegoers, because, you know, we, we all sense that there, in, given some set of circumstances, in some kind of world, that we too could be tempted, um, and that, that that sort of danger is always sort of lurking out there. So when we, when we read a noir novel or watch a movie, we have this sort of, we get the vicarious pleasure, and then at the end we can retreat and not have to experience the punishment that, that the noir protagonist has, has to go through. I always think of, there's this great line in Double Indemnity, the novel, um, where Walter, you know, he meets the femme fatale, who's Barbara Stanwyck in the movie, and he has this sense immediately that she is going to ruin his life, and he can, and that is exactly what draws, that's what makes him run a run to her, that fact that, you know, she will be his ruin, and he talks about his standing on the edge of a cliff and just peering over and peering over and peering over and, and not being able to stop himself. And I think that, that that sort of is in all of us, is, is the appeal of noir. And I've often thought that about protagonists, both in the fiction and in the films, is that um, there is this... this um, situation where the, it's the understanding of the criminal element in some way. Uh, in the same way that gangster films in the 30s understood it from a sociological point of view, noir was trying to understand it from a, a psychological point of view in putting yourself in that situation and, and figuring out who could be tempted by what to do that, to cross the criminal boundaries. Right, yeah, exactly. I mean, they are sort of, that's an interesting distinction you're just making between the, the sociological view in the 30s. We don't think so much about motive when we see a gangster movie. The motive is, is this is America, and you mm -hmm. can, you know, and you can, making money is what we do, and that, that's sort of the analysis. But when you see noir, there's this, this sense um, that, that there are these sort of primal drives that we can never really suppress, that they're eternal. And I think one of the reasons noir endures and isn't tied necessarily to a specific time period, even though we so associate with the 40s, is that you know there's always going to be lust, there's always going to be greed, there's always going to be a desire for revenge, that these things don't go away. Um, they're part of our human psychology, and, and so it sort of always works, <laughs> you know? Right. We all, and we always can identify with that, the timelessness of it. Well, in, in the interest of everyone can identify with it, uh, you did write a book about white masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think it's interesting talking about both your books and, and, and gender in general within this sort of genre, because even our film tonight, Gilda, is, is named after a woman, but she's not really the main character. For the most part, you write about female protagonists, and is 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 there a difference in in writing one from the other, and is is it that universal um, 
desire. It's interesting with, because um, people often say that, um, especially because of my nonfiction book, you know, did you start writing noir to correct that there were no women in noir? You know, the only women that were in noir were femme fatales or, or, or um, you know, occasionally the girlfriend way in the background who's mostly you don't want to see. Um, but, uh, but it actually wasn't that way for me at all. I mean, I sort of felt there was more of an open space because there were, you know, it's really hard in some ways to write noir without falling into kitsch now. Because there's things that we sort of know about it. We know the, the trench coat and the fedora and the bourbon and the death drawer and the Venetian blinds. And so it can be hard to, to avoid that. But it's not hard at all when you're writing about a school, a female school teacher, because there's just no precedent in noir for it. So that was sort of more my motive. But what I found when actually writing these women is that that nothing's really different because it's really not about gender, it's about power mm -hmm. and it's about fear. And these things, you know, uh, are, you know, gender free, you know, when I, Queen Pin is about a female, um, a very successful female criminal and her protege. And they could be men and it would be the same thing. One of them has the power, one's the up and com comer. You know that there's going to be a double cross and there's going to be a betrayal. And that, you know, whether they're men or women or, you know, it's really kind of the same. So, so that, that's sort of what I've found, um, that it's, um, that gender is absolutely culturally important to the rise of the genre and the history of it. And, um, but that the genre stands, you know, gender free. <laughs> And, but you do, or you have up until now, placed your novels in historical periods where uh, culturally women do have less power than they do now. Is, was that part of the reason that you placed them then? Um. I mean, the real, the real reason why I placed them in the past is that I, I'm sort of so haunted and enchanted by that period. So it's really just an excuse to sort of indulge myself in endless <laughs> research and watching 1930s movies and collecting, you know, cocktail napkins and, and things like that. I mean, that's like the honest reason. Um, but were I to try to give my an intellectual reason, um, you know, I would say... Um, I would say it's it's not uh, there is no intellectual reason for it. If you know, I mean, it just um, I would say the one intellectual reason might be that there's certain appeal I think to the last time when opposite sexes felt very foreign and there therefore it's eroticized. Um, I think one of the reasons Mad Men is so popular now is as much as we don't want to be back there and you know I don't want to make coffee for my boss and all these things, um, there is something about that dance when there was a lot of mystery in the opposite sex, you know. And there was a lot of, um, you know, that everything it was in shadows in part. And now we're, you know, we're all so on top of each other all the time mm -hmm. that, that that sort of mystery is gone. So that might be the part that, that seems, you know, tied um, to specificity to me. It's, it's interesting that you bring that up. I hadn't thought that about your writing, but <clears throat> there, there is definitely that, that foreignness in, in that your protagonists go through. And... It's tied a lot to the, the classic noirs that I think of, like uh, Double Indemnity or Postman Always Rings Twice, where there's this sort of loss of sexual control that they all go through, and, and it, it puts them in sort of a haze. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the cane, you know, is sort of a prime inspiration for me. And he, he has the, you know, the, in, in Postman Always Rings Twice, you know, whether you know the book or the movie, you know that these two, they're just like wild cats going at each other. And, there's this, I think there's this one sexual episode in it, and, and, and um, you know, they've had their, they're fighting, they're biting each other, they're doing all this sort of, you know, beast-like things, and he looks at Cora, the, the femme fatale, and he says, you know, she looked like the great-grandmother of every whore in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most awful lie. <laughs> and why would that be a good thing? I don't know. The great-grandmother, you know, I don't know. It's so puzzling, but it makes absolute sense because it, it's like a haze. It's, it's a haze. It's just such hardcore desire. Um, it's so primitive. Mm.